Well, good morning. We're uh, looking at the book of Ezekiel, and we're in chapter 12. I'm going to read the first 16 verses. We're going to be thinking about shattered optimism this morning. That's the title of this section. So beginning in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore thou, son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing, and remove by day in their sight, and thou shalt remove from thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they will consider, though they be a rebellious house. Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight, a stuff for removing, and thou shalt go forth at even in their sight, as they that go forth into captivity. Dig thou through the wall in their sight, and carry out thereby. In their sight shall they thou bear it upon thy shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, that thou see not the ground. For I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. And I did so as I was commanded. I brought forth my stuff by day, as stuff for captivity. And in the even, I dig through the wall with mine hand. I brought it forth in the twilight, and I bear it upon my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerneth the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel that are among them. Say, I am your sign, like as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby. He shall cover his face that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it though he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him and all his bands, and I will draw out the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I, have, I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them in the countries. But I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, and from the pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whither they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word this morning. So we said the theme of shattered up optimism. We're kind of in a new section now, uh, just a, a little bit of a review. 8 through 11, remember he was taken uh, in spirit uh, from the uh, banks of the Kibar uh, into Jerusalem to see the reasons why the glory of God had abandoned the house of God, the temple, and why judgment was essential uh, on uh, the land of Judah. And so we've come out of that now into a new section that is really from chapter 12 right through to chapter 24. And it's a section that is all about, as we, I think, mentioned last time, objections to judgment. Uh, They're basically uh, being raised so that they can be demolished. And that's what we're going to see. And so we'll observe Uh, particularly here in this chapter, that he's going back to his acting role once again. And so in verses 1 through 20, Ezekiel is going to act out two parables. And then in verse 21 through 28 of this chapter, Ezekiel is going to answer two objections, uh, objections to divine judgment that they are raising against him. So as we said, we're going to call it shattering false optimism. These two acted parables. And uh, in verses 1 through 16, the first parable, the passage we read, is about the fate of the prince. 
about Zedekiah, what's going to happen to him. And then verse 17 through 20 is going to highlight for us the fear of the people. So the fate of the prince and the fear of the people. So that's basically what we're going to be looking at today in the will of the Lord. So beginning in verse one, we have this uh, refrain that continues throughout the book. The word of the Lord also came unto me saying. And so God is speaking uh, to his servant, the prophet again. And so he reminds him in verse two, he says, son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. And so the people, again, he's reminded the people among whom the prophet dwelt are rebellious. And of course, the idea is defiant against divine authority, uh, provoking Jehovah with their with their uh, rebellion, their defiance, constantly in opposition uh, to <clears throat> to God. And we had seen actually in chapter two uh, that right at the outset of his ministry, he had been told uh, repeatedly in verses three through eight that he had been called to speak to a rebellious nation, and uh, that's uh, th that was the the time frame that he uh, ministered uh, uh, at a time when men were in deep rebellion against their God. And what a difficult time it is. And sadly, uh, we see much of the similar uh, mentality in the day we find ourselves in. And, and it's even sadder when you find it sometimes among professing Christians, that rebellious spirit that says uh, to you, uh, when you point something out from Scripture, they say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but <laughs> that's a very scary thing, isn't it? The, the man's rebellion, when God reveals his word clearly, and yet their heart is so antagonistic. Even people who are claimed to be saved. I know that's what the Bible says, but, and it's a very, very frightening thing. And so certainly the, the proof of their rebellion had been shown to the prophet in the previous chapters, in chapters 8 through 11. If ever he knew uh, just what God was uh, facing in these rebellious people, it was now very clear to him as a result of his being taken to Jerusalem and being shown the very things that they were doing, even in the very sanctuary of God. Notice it emphasizes that they had eyes to see, and that has the idea of the action sermons. Remember that he is God has been using this man to give action sermons. He says they have eyes to see, but he says, and see not, even though God had been making it plain through these action sermons. They have ears to hear. This is the explanatory messages that he had given to explain the things that he'd acted out. And so he is to hear, but they hear not. And here's a very sad thing. <clears throat> this is kind of a repeated thing in the word of God. I want to just talk about this idea of having eyes to see and seeing not, ears to hear and hearing not. Uh, just uh, look with me, please, at Isaiah chapter 6. Very well-known a uh, passage uh, where Isaiah sees, again, the glory of, of the Lord. Uh, and the uh, New Testament tells us it was the Lord Jesus he saw uh, when we look at John chapter 12. But uh, in Isaiah 6, verse 9 and 10, we read this. He said, go and tell this people, hear you indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. And so, again, we see this uh, this same idea of ears to hear, eyes to see, but they don't. And part of it here is they just they have they have been so rebellious for so long. God, it's almost like God gives them over and says, "Okay, if that's the way you want it, then that's the way it's going to be." Look at Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 21. Again, just this, this same thought being conveyed. It says, uh, Jeremiah 5, 21, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. 
And now I want us to go into the New Testament in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Now, this is a very interesting chapter because it comes after the defiant rejection of the Messiah in chapter 12. In fact, the Lord Jesus had done so many miracles and he had done one that was so evidently proof that he was Messiah. And yet in chapter 12, they accused him of doing his work in the power of the devil. And that was kind of their ultimate rejection of the Lord Jesus. And so when you get to chapter 13, everything changes. The Lord begins to speak in parables. And you'll notice, again, this same idea in verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. Again, this is after seeing so many miracles by the Lord Jesus and hearing the greatest teacher that ever graced this earth. And yet they, they, they had eyes to see, but they didn't see. Ears to hear, but they didn't hear. And so God says, okay, if that's the way they want it, that's the way it will be. Look at Acts 28. And we're going to pull this together, hopefully, in a moment. But I just there's a reason that we're doing this, going through these references. Isaiah 20, uh, sorry, Acts 28, verse uh, 26 and 27. So there is Paul, and he's speaking to the Jews uh, in the synagogue in Rome. And he says, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, seeing you shall see and not perceive, for the heart of this people is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. And if I could make a suggestion to you, I want to suggest this, that what we have here is that the nation of Israel in the Old Testament passages, so Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, they're rejecting the testimony of God in the Old Testament. Even though they saw amazing things and they heard amazing things, and yet they hardened their hearts, they didn't respond to it. So you have God rejected in the Old Testament. In the incident in Matthew 13, you have God the Son being rejected by them in the New Testament. They see great miracles, proof that he is without question the Messiah. And again, they basically come to the conclusion, we will not have this man to reign over us. They reject outright what they've seen with their eyes and heard with their ears. They reject it. And then he gets to the book of Acts. And we could say this, that they've rejected the testimony of God, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Because the Holy Spirit had been given on Pentecost, amazing things had happened. And at the end of it, even though they saw with their eyes and heard with their ears, they still reject it. And so as a result of rejecting the testimony of God in three persons, in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the Acts, God has nothing more to say, in a sense. And they are now set aside... Thank God, not permanently, but they're set aside in the purposes of God, and he is now working through the church until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then he will take up his dealings with that rebellious nation once again. So it is just kind of interesting, this phrase uh, that is a kind of a repetition, eyes to see and see not, ears to hear and hear not. And what a tragedy, by the way, to be in that condition. And uh, we just need to constantly say, Lord, help me. I, I want to see and I want to hear what you want to convey. And I want to be responsive and tender hearted. Don't ever let me become hard against your revelation. Uh, help us to see what you want us to see, hear what you want us to hear. But these people, um, this is how uh, God describes them. And he says at the end of verse two, for <laughs> here's the explanation. They are a rebellious house. That's the simple explanation. Even after these clear messages, 
of impending and certain judgment, there's still the prevailing idea among the exiles based on false optimism that they would be they would have an early return to Jerusalem and the land of Canaan and uh, Jer Jerusalem and Judah would be uh, preserved that they're still believing this. So he says in verse three, therefore thou son of man, prepare the stuff for removing and remove by day in their sight and thou shalt remove from thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they will consider though they be a rebellious house. Don't you see something of the amazing long suffering of God in this? Well, just just do another act for me, Ezekiel. It might be that they may consider. And so you see something of God just going to such lengths, even though they've been so rebellious. Uh, let's let's do another uh, visual aid, and then we'll give them an explanation. Just see if they might respond. And, and you see something of the heart of God in his long suffering here. And so... The message of verse 3 down to verse 16 is that there is going to be no escape from captivity, even for the leaders, because really what we're going to be seeing here is you're going to give this little uh, little acting uh, segment, and it's really going to be about the prince, that the prince himself is not going to uh, survive or escape, uh, and so neither will the people either. So he is to play the part of an exile. He's to remove his stuff from his house, meager belongings like that carried by someone uh, who's going in exile and has to leave quickly. Uh, he has to do it by day uh, to indicate their preparing, preparations to escape the city. Uh, it's to be done in the sight of the captives in order that they might consider. And so it, it, we're going to see it's going to be very meager. Like when you have to get out and you only have a short time to get out you, what you need is essential things the the essential things for survival you can't take all your trinkets and all those other things it has to be things of significance and so a typical exile uh, who was basically being uh, thrown out of his land he would take the barest essentials a skin for water uh, or we would say a water bottle these days, but a skin for water, a mat for sleeping, a bowl for food, uh, perhaps a staff uh, in his hand, uh, uh, his purse, a wallet, uh, a few provisions and vessels needed for the way, and that would be about it. Can't take anything superfluous. It's, you can't carry it, it's not going. That's the mentality. And you don't want to be carrying things that are of no value. So it says uh, he's to do it in their sight. So this is, again, a demonstration for them to see. And he says, verse 4, thou shalt, Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight as stuff for removing, and thou shalt go forth at even in their sight as they uh, that go forth into captivity. And so this is uh, what he is to do, to act out as if he was being taken into captivity. Now, of course, it wouldn't have been difficult because everybody that he is speaking to and the actor who's acting has already experienced what it is to go into exile, right? All of these individuals are people who already have experienced exile. So they, they, they'll get this clearly, uh, the stuff for removing, again, these essential items with which a captive uh, would require on the journey uh, at, uh, to their destination and everything is to be carried so again the amount severely limited and then another little picture he gives in verse 5 is dig thou through the wall in their sight and carry out thereby what you notice again it says over and over again in their sight this is for them to see th this uh, little play that he's doing so he's now in the twilight of the evening we see that from verse six in their sight shall thou bear it upon thy shoulder carry it forth in the twilight thou shalt cover thy face so on and so forth so in the twilight of the evening he has to dig through the wall uh, uh, most likely from his own home uh, babylon uh, was um, the housing was made by sun-dried bricks and so that would make it 
uh, a doable thing to to dig a hole in your wall and come out. And you can imagine the people thinking, what's this guy up to now? You know, here he is digging a hole in his wall and coming out with a few stuff and carrying it on his shoulders. Not difficult to imagine the scene. Digging through the wall suggests the action of those who in a time of siege are attempting to escape undetected. That's the picture that's in view here. And as they uh, watched him carry the burden on his shoulder, it would bring back many memories of the hardship and despondency that they had experienced less than seven years before. Since all the exiles had participated in a deportation themselves, either in 605 BC or 597 BC, they would have understood clearly Ezekiel's picture of deportation that is being conveyed to them. So in verse 6, uh, it says in their sight, shall thou bear it on thy shoulder, carry it forth in the twilight, thou shalt cover thy face. So here's another little added dimension, covering his face that you see not the ground, for I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. So it's to cover his face as he carries this meager belongings on his shoulders. Now, of course, we know ultimately, and we're going to see in this chapter, that what the reason that he's doing this is because he's acting out what the experience of the prince will be. Because, as we're going to see, uh, the king of Babylon is going to put out the prince's eyes. So he's not going to see where he's going. But there maybe is some other uh, messages that are being conveyed here. They're trying to escape unrecognized um, and uh, uh, undetected. Uh, so maybe expressing that thought as well. So once again, uh, Ezekiel the prophet is seen to be a sign unto the house of Israel. Uh, that's another important and significant thing we see at the end of verse 6. I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. We saw that in chapter 4, at verse 3, and we'll see it throughout the book. The prophet himself is to be a sign. Uh, and he says um, at the end of verse uh, 3, it says, this shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Uh, the prophet is meant to be a sign. He's been sent by God to be a sign to the house of Israel. His very actions are meant to be a sign. So verse 7 says, and I did so as I was commanded. How different to the rebellious house who saw and heard <laughs> but didn't respond to the prophet of God who did exactly as he was commanded, even though it meant damaging his own property, putting a hole in his own house, yet he still did it. Uh, are we not reminded of the words of Mary in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 5? Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. <laughs> oh, that we would have hearts like that, that whatever the Lord said to us, we would comply, we would do it, and do it willingly. Well, that's what Ezekiel does. He responds beautifully. He, he says, and I did so as I was commanded. I brought forth my stuff by day as stuff for captivity. And in the even I dig through the wall with mine hand. I brought it forth in the twilight. I bear it upon my shoulder in their sight. So he did exactly what he was commanded to do. Now he's been given the permission to explain his actions. Because remember that our prophet is mute unless the Lord speaks through him. And so it says in verse um, 8, And in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? So God begins by asking him a question. Ezekiel, did they ask you anything about what you did? <laughs> was was their curiosity piqued at all? And did they did they make inquiries? What, and you could imagine them saying, "What are you up to now, Ezekiel?" <laughs> They've seen him do some strange things, and now they say, "Ezekiel, what are you up to now? What are you what are you doing?" And so, verse nine, it, it says, uh, uh, "The Lord is asking, have they asked you what you're doing?" Verse 10, say thou unto them. So again, God has given him the ability to speak. 
Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, The burden concerneth the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel that are among them. So now we're getting some specific details. He's given permission to speak. The burden is quite specific. It's concerning the prince, Zedekiah. Kind of interesting that Ezekiel never calls him the king. He always calls him the prince. And um, uh, he, he still acknowledges Jehoiakim as the king. And so uh, Zedekiah is always referred to uh, as the prince. And of course, that man Zedekiah was, uh, if you, if you re recall, he was put over Israel by the king of Babylon, uh, almost like a puppet king, even though he was from the seed uh, royal, uh, he was put there as king. And uh, what, what we find is that scripture tells us a little bit about this man, uh, Zedekiah. Uh, just, uh, this, this is kind of God's summary about what kind of man this was. Second Kings 24. Second Kings 24, King, this is Zedekiah. Second Kings 24, verse 19. This is God's summary of this man. It says, He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> so certainly uh, not a very nice thing to be said about this man. I wonder what the Lord would say about us. <laughs> Don't we want to hear from him that well done, thou good and faithful servant? Uh, would be a terrible thing if he had something else to say about us. But here he says concerning this king that he was evil, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So again, back in verse 11, it says, say, I am your sign. Like as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. And so, again, God has made him their sign. Like as I have done, the action sermon, the idea of going through the walls, seeking to go uh, as an exile with meager belongings, that's exactly what is going to happen. And so he's, he's addressing those that are still in Jerusalem, in a sense, that this is what they're going to do. But he's letting those in captivity know that there's no going back. If this is what's going to happen to the prince, if this is what's going to happen to the house of Israel, all their optimism is fake. There's no way they're going back. This is, this is the fate of Prince Zedekiah. And it's given to us in detail in verses 12 and 13. It says this, And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby. He shall cover his face that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him. He shall be taken into my snare. I will bring him in Babylon, uh, to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. So here's a, a clear explanation. In other words, what he's saying is this, this King Zedekiah is going to make a run for it. Carrying his stuff, going through the city walls. So they're hearing that not only has God allowed them to be deported, but there will yet be more deportations, including the prince, removed into captivity. Not just uh, captivity itself will bring grief, but even the prince will have to submit to the shame of shouldering his own stuff for removing. Uh, normally, uh, you you don't see royalty carrying their own baggage. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, whenever uh, Queen Elizabeth visited Canada, she didn't carry her suitcases. <laughs> Somebody else would have done that, right? That's the way it would have been. And so certainly uh, here they're, sh they're being shown that uh, there's no dignity even left for their uh, king. Uh, the contempt uh, which these people would be viewed by Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, they they would be carrying their own stuff like captives. 
Notice as well, and it's it's very significant here in that in verse 13, he he talks about my net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet shall he not see it, though he'll die there. So we want to just emphasize that, uh, that that God is telling us that, yes, he and, and we've seen this throughout our study, that he's using the Babylonians as his instruments, but actually God is the one who is behind the judgment. This is my net, my snare, I will bring him. And so uh, the people must learn that the, the Lord is the one who is bringing this discipline on the nation. And so... Uh, this is uh, fulfilled, and again, if we go back to Second Kings, we're going to see how accurately the prophecy of uh, Ezekiel is. So, Second Kings twenty-five, Second Kings twenty-five is where this prophecy will find its fulfillment. And we're going to read um, from verses 1 through 7. It says, It came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his hosts, against Jerusalem, and pitched against it. And they built forts against it round about. The city was besieged unto the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city. There was no bread for the people of the land and the city was broken up and all the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between two walls which is by the king's garden now the chaldees were against the city round about and the king went the way toward the plain the army of the chaldees pursued after the king took over him in the plains of jericho and all his army were scattered from him so they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, to Ribla, and they gave judgment upon him. And now listen to verse 7. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters of brass, and carried him to Babylon. What a, a, a kind of a amazing thing. To The last thing he sees with his physical eyes is his own sons being slaughtered before him, and then his eyes are put out. And so all these things took place uh, just as had been prophesied. And of course, the, the destruction of the king was like the dropping of a net over a wild beast, uh, my net. And so the idea was uh, dragging away the captive. That's the picture. What is interesting is Josephus, tells us an, an interesting aside here. Now, again, we, we can't be uh, dogmatic about what jo Josephus said, but this is what he says, kind of interesting. He tells us the message that is given here in this chapter was sent by Ezekiel to Zedekiah as a warning to surrender and not to try to escape. Because, because of an apparent contradiction between Jeremiah who said the king of Babylon would carry him away to Babylon in bonds, whereas Ezekiel said he would not see Babylon. Therefore, he refused to believe what he considered to be the con contradictory message. And of course, the rest is history. He went to Babylon, but he didn't see it because his eyes were put out. Both of them were accurate. Jeremiah said he's going to be carrying him to Babylon. Ezekiel said he wouldn't see it. And the reason he wouldn't see it is because he wouldn't have eyes to see it. His eyes would be put out. So again, the, the absolute accuracy of the word of God and Zedekiah had his eyes put out and then was taken captive into captivity. Again, we see the same fulfillment described for us in Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse 6 and 7 where uh, we read very in a much briefer account. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes, eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire, break down the walls of Jerusalem. So basically, this is the fulfillment of this picture. And again, the as we say, the 
there's another picture here that we don't want to miss, and that is this. Rejecting light always results in darkness. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. The last king of Judah that's mentioned in the text here has his eyes put out. And blindness is the result. We see in the New Testament, spiritual blindness has happened to Israel. Why? Because of rejection of light. And we, we have to be very, very careful that we don't fail to respond to light. Because the, the principle in the word of God is this. The greater the light rejected, the greater the darkness. <laughs> How great the darkness. And so may we always be tenderhearted and respond to light. So <clears throat> now the Babylonians were not known to be as cruel as the Assyrians who had uh, conquered Israel 130 years earlier, but they still were pretty cruel. And imagine seeing your own sons have their eyes put out or, or, or killed and then have your eyes put out there and spend your rest of your days in darkness with your last memory seeing the death of your sons. So all these prophecies were delivered uh, to in the sixth year uh, and uh, there um, th these prophecies would be fulfilled five years later when Jerusalem would be taken and so basically uh, in the twelfth year and so again they're getting lots of warning but they're not responding so he says in verse 14 I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him and all his bands, and I will draw out the sword after him. So those of the army uh, that tried to help him are going to be scattered. God will draw out the sword against them. And again, the uh, sign is not just concerning Zedekiah, but the whole house of Israel. And so they would all inevitably face the net and the judgment. And so, again, this is shattering their false optimism. Verse 15 it says, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them in the countries. And so those, the remnant that are remained scattered amongst the nations, dispersed amongst the, the countries. Verse 16, but I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, from the pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whither they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. The promise of the surviving remnant uh, is this, that they will testify to the righteousness of God in bringing judgment. They'll declare all their abominations. They'll say, this is why God has allowed us to be desolate. This is why he has brought this severe punishment. And he says, they shall know that I am the Lord. The declaration would be both a confession of their sin and testimony of the relentlessness of their misery. All of this has happened to them because of their rebellion against God. So from verse 17 onwards now, a further sign, another little bit of acting for our man Ezekiel. And this time, it's not so much the fate of the prince that's in view. It's the fear of the people. And so it says, verse 17, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking, and drink thy water with trembling and with carefulness. And say unto the people of the land, Thus saith the Lord God of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and of the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with carefulness, and drink their water with astonishment, that they, their, that her land may be desolate from all that is therein because of the violence of all them that dwell therein. So most likely the very following day, he gets to act out another picture, maybe at the time when the prophet took his meal. And remember, he's still eating famine food uh, that we read, read about in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 9. He's still acting these things out before them. I, I would suspect, by the way, that if Ezekiel was in any way chunky, 
Uh, by the time he'd finished his prophecy, he had shed a few pounds because he's only eating measured barley bread and drinking water. He has a very restricted diet. And so this time he was to take his meal in front of their eyes and he is to reveal to them, again, the fear with which the people would eat their bread. So again, this famine food, bread and water, he ate it as if gripped by fear, quaking and trembling at the same time with carefulness, not wanting to waste a crumb or a drop. Uh, you know, it's interesting in our society, of course, I, as I travel, I get taken out to eat lots of times, and I'm amazed at how much food we waste stuff left on the plate but listen if you're living in a famine condition <laughs> you don't waste anything every little crumb left on the plate you're going to eat it up and so he that's the way it is he's eating with fear with carefulness uh and of course he's picturing what it would be like for the people that in in this famine condition food is running out and what little bit they have maybe this would be their last meal and so they're, they're trying to as it were, make it last, savor every bit of it, and make sure that nobody steals it from them. Because if food is scarce, somebody else, maybe with a bit more strength than them, might want to take it. So you get the idea of them being very, very careful, uh, quaking, shaking with fear. And he's saying this is what will be the experience uh, of uh, those of, that are the inhabitants of Jerusalem as they wait for the enemy to break down their defenses and swarm into the city, they're eating the, their meal with great fear. Notice verse 19. It says, Say unto the people of the land, Thus saith the Lord God, Of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and of the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with carefulness, drink their water with astonishment, that her land may be desolate from all that is therein because of the violence of all them that dwell therein. Once more, the Lord opens Ezekiel's mouth for the explanation of the people of the land. Just as uh, Ezekiel was eating his bread, so would they. Again, a reiteration of God's promise in chapter 4, uh, verse 16 and 17. Let me just read that. This is kind of repeating the same idea. It says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight with care. They shall drink water by measure with astonishment. They shall that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. So that's the picture that's been uh, conveyed to us. In verse 20, he says, And the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste, and the land shall be desolate, and you shall know that I am the Lord. All of these things would produce the the overwhelming evidence that this is that God is the God of prophecy and the God of justice and the God of righteousness. The sign re reveals to us the distress of the siege and the things that they would experience. Of course, one of the greatest evidence that there is for the reliability of Scripture is what we call fulfilled prophecy. And we, we're seeing it right here. The very things that uh, Ezekiel tells uh, them will actually come to pass, literally, just as he has acted them out before them and explained them. So now the, the final little section from verse 21 down to verse 28 is answering the false prophet's deluded optimism. So notice it says this, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. So this is the this is where this false optimism is coming from. It's a proverb that is being spoken by those of a rebellious mindset, a common parlance in the land. The days are prolonged, and every vision fails. So it, here's the reason for their false op optimism given by the false prophets. The days are prolonged. God's long suffering will mean he will not allow Jerusalem and Judah to fall. The days are prolonged. Every vision faileth. And especially the visions and prophecies of Jeremiah, 
uh, in the land and Ezekiel among the captives, all of this is not going to be fulfilled. So there's, there's kind of two voices that are crying in the wilderness, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And then you've got all these false prophets on the other hand and telling the people what they want to hear. They're eager to hear with their itching ears. And they're being told, you don't have to worry. Everything's going to be fine. And, uh, you know, the, the tragedy is that this really is about the long-suffering of God. It should have led them to repentance, shouldn't it? Um, look at Second Peter, and we're going to look at Second Peter for a little while here because it's so pertinent to what we're considering uh, at the moment. Second Peter, and we look at chapter 3, where we learn about the long-suffering of God. Second Peter 3 and verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the reason why God doesn't judge swiftly is to give man opportunity to repent. And we've seen examples of that over and over again in the word of God. Uh, the iniquity of the Amorites is not full. He waits till it reaches its peak. In that waiting period, uh, before he judges them, you have people like Rahab get saved. And so God's long-suffering, the idea of bringing people to repentance. However, sadly, some take it a different way. And so I want you to notice again in Second Peter verse uh chapter 3 verse 3 and 4 it says this knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation and so they have a very same attitude today you know, things just continue on you know nothing to worry about all this all these people talking about the Lord coming and judgment and all the rest of it. Don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. We're, it, it's not going to happen. It's not. Uh, it's it's for a long time off. Uh, we can just live our lives. And so that's exactly what's going on. In fact, just one other scripture I want to read in relation to this is uh, from the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a really interesting little scripture that one of the dangers of deferred judgment <laughs> And this is Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. It says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And that's exactly, sadly, what's going on. God gives them this extra time, so they come to repentance. But because judgment is not executed speedily, the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. So contextually here, Ezekiel began his ministry in the fifth year of his captivity, and it's not until the twelfth year that the word came from Jerusalem that the city had fallen. That's found in Ezekiel 33 verse 21. So during those seven years of his ministry, people got careless and said it would never happen. And that's the proverb that's going on. That's the proverb that he's talking about. That um, he says, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. It's amazing. The Lord Jesus would say in his generation, you can read this, the, 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 the weather <laughs> Uh, people can predict the weather by looking at the sky, but they cannot see the signs of the times. And that's exactly what's going on here, that they uh, they can make other predictions, but they're, they're not willing to respond uh, in this time of long suffering. So verse 23 is the Lord's rebuttal. And he says this, tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease. They shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. So 
God says, I'm going to give you a new proverb to replace the false one. And that is this. The days are at hand, the effect of every vision. Other translations put it this way. The days are near when every vision will be fulfilled. In other words, there's a day coming when all this is going to be completed. Verse 24, for there shall be no more any vain vision nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. Tragedy is that this false hope was a cause of vain or, or worthless visions of the false prophets, uh, and that was going to cease within the house of Israel. God is going to bring it to an end. And of course, notice as well that even the use of the word divination uh, would tell us that uh, they were getting their messages, but they weren't coming from God, but from an alternative source. And so he says, verse 25, For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall not be no more prolonged, for in the day, in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, says the Lord. So the Lord says, I'm going to bring these things to fulfillment. God promises fulfillment of his word because he is the Lord. Delay is about to come to an end, and I will say say the word and perform it. And of course, the Babylonian hordes were simply waiting his command to bring the people into his net. And so God tells Ezekiel that he will end their arrogance and their rebellion by swiftly bringing to fulfillment the prophecies they had held in contempt. Last Final little statement, verse 26. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, behold, they are the house of Israel, say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of the times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, there shall not of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, says the Lord. So the next thing they, they say is, well, it's for a long time off. Don't have to worry about it. Uh, denying imminency of God's judgment. It's for a long time to come in the future. Of course, there are many that are like that today. They deny the imminency of the Lord's coming. Uh, they deny the fact that he is bringing things to a climax in world history. Oh, we've got thousands of years ahead of us and all the rest of it. And uh, they call us, uh, you know, those that believe that Christ is coming and uh, believe in the, the pre-millennial, pre-tribulation teaching of the word of God. They call us pessimists. Oh, we're going to be building uh, a, a kingdom for the Lord that's going to last for thousands of years. And, and they've got this long-term view, and they think we're very negative and pessimistic. Verse 28, say, say to them, thus saith the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged. God's answer is none of my words are going to be prolonged. They're bringing judgment. And the tragedy is that, that even if the Lord did delay, how could they possibly be content in their present circumstances? The tragedy is that they didn't respond to God's prophets. Six years later, Babylon's army would breach the walls of Jerusalem in Ezekiel's prophecy come true. Just as in those days, even so now, God's promise of judgment is shrugged off by many. False bravado of those who contradict the clear statements of Scripture cause people to not be concerned about eternity, about their destiny, about these important things. There's a false optimism in our day, just as there was in Ezekiel's day. But we have to say, judgment is coming. And the question is, are we ready for it? And are we right with God? And that's important to make sure that we're in a position where we're ready, uh, should the Lord bring judgment. Of course, for those of us that know the Lord Jesus, uh, we have a blessed hope of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. What a what a prospect is ours. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.